My name is Mike Gaben and welcome to my KSP campaign. It was 20 game days ago that Svetlana and Luya were sent up to Kerbin Station with a specific mission in mind, but lacking the vehicle to perform said mission. Well, that is about to be finally rectified. The original plan was for Svetlana and Luya to hitch up with Bartner who was also aboard the Kerbin station, and take the original Corian uh, outside of Kerbin's sphere of influence, much the same way as Jeb and Glafia and Chrissy <laughs> uh, are, are, are coming back from doing exactly that. But uh, I completely didn't really think of the timing of all of this and how long it would take the Corian to get out of Kerbin's sphere of influence and return that I realized I'm going to need a second vehicle, and this is it. This is the Corian 2 on its way up to Kerbin Station. As you can see, uncrewed, as I like to do, because like the Corian, this thing is incapable of descending safely. I guess it can descend, but not in a safe way. Um, the idea being that this will become once another Kerbin system runabout. Uh, but unlike the Corian, uh, this thing contains a number of upgrades because the Corian has been doing its thing around the Kerbin system for 144 game days. So obviously in that time I have unlocked quite a bit more tech. And do not worry if you are a fan of the original Corian, I have no plans on mothballing that thing just yet. Uh, I have more than enough to do in about the Kerbin system to warrant having two of these runabouts. Back to the mission. Again, the original idea was for Svetlana and company to exit Kerbin's sphere of influence, mostly just for the experience. But uh, during that time that they were cooling their heels aboard Kerbin Station, you know, contracts come and go, and I picked up a contract to rescue a scientist named Shell Cow, who is stuck in orbit about the moon. And I love, I do really like these, uh, uh, Kerbal rescue missions, um, not for the money as much as it is for just, well, they're easy, and also because uh, they give you Kerbals for free, right? So I'm going to be picking up Shell Cal, and I think maybe that would be an appropriate first mission, just to do a quick run out to the moon and back, just to make sure everything is working well before we do something as ambitious as leaving Kerbin's sphere of influence. Now those two ginormous radiators that I just deployed, I suppose are one big hint as to what the one of the main differences is between this this Karayan and the old Karayan. But uh, another one is that this guy can carry quite a bit more Kerbals. The original Karayan can only carry four Kerbals. This can carry up to seven um, thanks to the three-person descent module. But also, and I think this is the first vessel where I'm using the Leak. I think they're called Leaks. Yes, Leak. And that's L-E-E-K, not L-E-A-K. I think L-E-A-K Leak would be a uh, bad name for a, for a capsule. But these are the leak capsules, uh, leak as in the vegetables, get it, the one before this one's the onion. Oh, well, anyway. Um, and these are orbital modules. They are not command modules, but they just provide additional space uh, aboard the vessel. But the main thing that's different is, of course, that this thing is nuclear powered. It is featuring two Nerva engines. Uh, these are Nerva engines from the Interstellar Extended mod. Now the boosters, of course, they're just boring old chemical rockets, but they have now finished doing their job, so it is time to ditch those. There they go, and then we'll fire up the Nervous. Excellent. Uh, and again, these are actually um, fairly equivalent to the stock LVN engines. Spec-wise, are very similar to, to what you get with those. And I could have actually used those, but I, I like these uh, interstellar extended engines um, because they force you to think about a few more things like waste heat. You can use them to generate electricity, though I'm not here. Um, and you can choose your propellants uh, this time. I went once again with liquid fuel as my propellant. No oxidizer. There's absolutely no oxidizer on this vessel other than what would be mixed in with the monopropellant. There we go. We'll perform our circularization. Just listen to it. Just wait. It's, it's a beautiful sound. Wait till I go to full thrust with this thing. But anyway, uh, we'll finish our circularization. I'll keep talking about these nervous though. 
once again, I decided not to go with the liquid hydrogen, which is my other option, um, mostly because electricity, um, you need to generate a lot of electricity in order to keep the hydrogen cold enough that it won't boil off on you. Um, there's not enough generation from solar panels in order to do that, so you're basically forced to put thermal electric generators on this. Uh, you have to connect the generator right to the engine, so it looked kind of dorky <laughs> when I did that, so I, I don't know, just aesthetically I didn't like it, so I didn't do it. The other thing I had an issue with is, well, this thing's going to be having to be refueled and all that kind of stuff, which means I would have to have something else that had liquid hydrogen on it as a fuel station, and that would have to have a whole lot of electricity. Kind of fun Maybe in the future I'll think about that, but it's a lot of infrastructure to put in place when I could just have the thing go on liquid uh, liquid fuel and, and, and it can just fuel up in the same place as the old Corian fuels up with. You can see though, it still gives you a pretty impressive amount of delta V, about 2300 meters per second of delta V. And there's not a whole lot of fuel on this, it's just that one back tank. That's all the fuel for the engines at all. Most of the length of this thing, as you can see, is taken up by uh, living space for my Kerbals. I kind of rather like that. Anyway, we are coming up to our transfer burnout to Kerbin Station, so why don't we pause a bit, take a listen to these engines as they fire up. Now, if you listen, you'll notice that they change in pitch. And I think that is meant to model or reflect changing temperatures within the engine. I don't know, but I do like it. Sounds cool, that's for sure. The Nerva, by the way, is uh, modeled after a completely real uh, engine that never did go into space, but it was certainly extensively tested. Uh, in, it sort of came up, I think it was sort of mid 60s, I believe when they started uh, designing and testing these things, uh, and it ended in the early 70s, uh, not because of lack of success, that's for sure. In fact, it, it was demonstrated that these engines very much outperformed their, uh, their chemical counterparts. There were some safety concerns, um, not from the exhaust, despite its appearances, uh, this thing is not spewing out radioactive fire out the back, uh, it is just superheated propellant. The, the radioactive material is contain, well contained within a very sturdily built reactor core. It's if that reactor core became breached, for instance, if there was some sort of an explosion. This was particularly a concern during ascent when the thing would still be in the atmosphere, though uh, it wasn't entirely clear whether it posed really any more real danger than, than the chemical rockets that are already being used. Personally, I sort of suspect that it had more to do with just public perception. As we moved into the 70s, there was a, definitely an anti-war movement going on, and rightfully, the proliferation of nuclear weapons was uh, becoming a growing and growing concern, and there was anti-public sentiment around that, and nuclear power kind of got rolled into that. I mean, uh, there was a, a tremendous backlash against nuclear power as we went into the 70s. And I don't want to start any sort of a debate in the comments section for sure, but but I will say this: if you if you gave me the choice of living next to a nuclear power station or say a coal power power station, well, for me that decision is a pretty easy one. I would take that nuclear power station any day of the week. Anyway, came in a little hotter than I normally would. Uh, kind of. Uh, sandblasting the paint off the station a bit here, I think. I'm sure this is not good for it. Again, it's not radioactive, but at the same time, uh, superheated propellant being blasted onto uh, a vessel containing herbals. Yeah, probably not the best idea. Um, the, the reason I came in so hot is just because I'm not used to this. Uh, the, the original Corian uh, has a pretty decent thrust to weight ratio, while this guy, uh, its maximum acceleration is under half a G, so uh, and, and that's perfectly adequate for what it needs to do out here, but I think I just need to get a bit used to it when it comes to these rendezvous and realize I need to uh, come in a little slower. It takes a little longer to get this thing to stop. You might notice at the front, 
that the docking port is actually obstructed by a probe core. I didn't put uh, a permanently installed probe core anywhere on this thing, but of course for it to be doing what it's doing right now, it does require a probe core or else I wouldn't be able to control it at all. So I, I just stuck one at the front there uh, using another docking port. And uh, so the idea is just going to be that uh, I'm going to send out a Kerbal to remove that, and then this thing will be able to dock. And then in the future, it won't need a probe core because it should always have a pilot after that. I am kind of regretting not putting any additional reaction wheels on this thing. Um, I just figured that uh, the reaction wheels that were already built into the three different crew cabins that are on this would uh, suffice, and they do, but it is a little sluggish. Some additional reaction wheels might have been nice. But anyway, why don't we send out Bartner and his backpack to go and retrieve the probe core and the docking port that is no longer required. This backpack, of course, coming from Kerbal Inventory System. And Bartner was able to make short work of this. Um, I needed the backpack because the docking port and the little adapter that's attached to it are 1.25 meter parts and individual Kerbals can't carry them, but this big box that's on Bartner's back can take them and we're going to keep these you don't know might find a use for them in the future but Bartner's going to go and put this container back onto Kerbin Station and then it's Svetlana's turn to do an EVA because now without the probe core I do need a pilot so I'm going to take Svetlana and get her aboard and with that we will we will dock this thing. And of course, docking is going to be heavily dependent on the RCS system. And I think actually this would be a good opportunity to uh, go back in time to the VAB when I was designing this thing. Talk about a very useful mod that I haven't talked about really that much. And that is the RCS build aid. Now I have talked about this mod a little bit. You saw me using it back when I was designing my uh, Columbia Space Shuttle Orbiter. Um, and there I was talking about making sure that the lateral thrust actually goes laterally perpendicular to the vessel. I've also talked about a little bit for calculating the amount of delta V you have due to monoprop, but here what I want to talk about is uh, using it to make sure that you don't have any torque when you start to use your RCS system for lateral translations. So I'm going to be putting on a thruster block here and what I want you to take note of is the little red circle that pops up. You can see it there around the center of mass indicator. And what that is indicating is the amount of torque that is being applied. I have it on right translation, so it's showing me the thrust from right translation, which is the right arrow, the red arrow there. But it's also telling me that I'm going to end up with about six and a half kilonewtons of torque, rotational force on the vessel. Um, that's not good. I want to keep that lower. So what I'm doing is looking at that rotational force and you can see now I brought it down to 2.2 kilonewtons with the addition of those other thruster blocks and then what you want to do is just just want to you know try it on different ones I've now switched it to up still telling me 2.2 kilonewtons of rotational uh, force which is is not great and I continued to play with it you do want to keep the thruster block still out from the central axis. You don't want to put it on the narrow parts of the ship. You want to put it on the fat part of the ships. And I played around with it for a little bit longer. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I ended up uh, neglecting to record my final version and uh, where I where I nailed where I got it in pretty close to zero. Um, and in fact, you can tell that because if you take a look at this here in the VAB, that configuration of fuel tanks down there towards the bottom is not the configuration that's on there now. But you get the idea of how this mod works. RCS build aid, really, really useful and giving you information that otherwise you just simply don't have unless you want to start calculating it out yourself. But anyway, let's get back to our docking. And as you can see, we are just about there now. And then once we have this docked, we will transfer aboard uh, Luya and Bartner. And then it's time to send these folks off towards the moon, okay? All right, there we go. You know, in hindsight, I don't know why I docked this at all. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it. There, I, don't, I didn't transfer any resources. It wasn't necessary. Uh, this thing is pretty much still fully stocked up. So uh, I just transferred over the Kerbals and undocked again and uh, sent these folks on their way. 
man, I love that sound. I swear, every time I start this, these engines, it sounds different than it did the last time. This is also giving you a good idea of the lack of a profound amount of acceleration that this thing has. It's not like we're getting away from the station at a record pace, but it is certainly more than adequate. Thrust to weight ratio is not a big deal once you are in orbit. Anyway, uh, let's get back to that message. You, uh, you might have noticed I had a message come up while I was in the process of getting this thing ready to dock. What that message was, was a message that I had completed a contract. Specifically a contract to improve Kerbin Station. Which really confused me because that contract required the attachment of a lab module. Uh, do you see a lab module anywhere around here? I sure don't. Oh, uh, anyway, uh, I do have actually my very next launch after this one that you'll be seeing next episode is that actual lab module and some extra stuff for Kerbin Station to uh, to try and tip it out a little bit further. But to obviously that contract got fulfilled anyway because I don't know. KSP got confused, I suppose. It seems to get confused pretty easily when it comes to uh, the station contracts. But anyway, it did free up uh, another contract slot. So I went over to Mission Control and picked up another contract. And this one was another rescue of Kerbal, specifically Christnik Kerbin, who is in low Kerbin orbit. In fact, not very far from where we are right now. So I thought once I got this burn out of the way that I would pop back to Kerbin Station Bill's still on Kerbin Station, and he has a variety of vehicles at his disposal. And we'll get him to go pick up Krisnik and uh, get a 2-4 rescue going on in this particular uh, video. And here we are in the later part of the burn. You might be noticing a distinct tint of red, especially on the engines and on the radiators. A little silly in my opinion, but uh, it is there, and in fact, if you take a look at the bottom left, you will see I'm getting overheating warnings on the engines as well, but don't worry, everything is well in hand. I have tested this thing thoroughly. Uh, the last time I launched a nuclear-powered vessel uh, a couple of episodes ago it was a small probe. I talked a bit about um, the differences in how interstellar and the stock deal with heat. In fact, they have two very different kinds of heat going, and you have to deal with both of them. Interstellar makes it easy for you by giving you a thermal helper in the VAB to help you decide what size of radiators you need to put on. Stock doesn't give you anything like that. So basically what I did to make sure that this, the radiators were able to handle the heating that's being generated right now, which is from stock, is I just got in simulation mode, put this thing in orbit, and just fired up the engines and just let them go. I ran it for as, you know, well past escape velocity, uh, well past any kind of reasonable burn, reasonable burn that I might be expected to do, and this thing survived just fine. I would certainly recommend to anybody, though, who's playing around with these nuclear engines, they do generate a lot of heat in stock, to make sure that you do put on enough radiators. Uh, or else you are going to get yourself into some trouble. Okay. Run a little further. He's got to get it down to Shell Cal's orbit. He's in a very, very low orbit. It's actually... Parts of it are under 10 kilometers. Bring it down here to match. About 9 kilometers ought to do it. Okay, there we go. That's going to do it. And uh, it's going to be a day before these guys get out here. So uh, in the meantime, let's hop over to Bill in Kerbin Station and see what the situation is with his rescue. Okay, so what we gotta check out is uh, where is Krisnik? <laughs> Keep forgetting the name. So we'll select him as a target here. Let's see, uh, ships, Chris, Krisnik, Krisnik's pod, there it is, okay. And see where he is and ooh, yeah, he's not really all that close. So Kerbin Station is uh, there on the right side of Kerbin. And Krisnik is, yeah, pretty much on the other side of the planet. And he's in the lower orbit. Start time warping. So he's going faster. Oh my gosh, he's got to catch. He's got to come most of the way around the planet and catch back up to Kerbin Station before we can do the rendezvous. Now I could put Bill into one of the vessels start doing some orbital finagling, but he's comfortable where he is. 
So I think what I'll do is just keep time warping and I'm watching the intercept angle. And when that intercept angle gets up to 360 degrees, that's when uh, we are in the right spot. But you can see that we are nowhere near that. And I am also keeping an eye on the Korion 2 and when it's going to be crossing into the moon's sphere of influence. Well, this is taking entirely too long. So uh, I did most of the time warping in the tracking station where I could do it a lot quicker. And then I hop back out as we are getting close. And I can see here my intercept angle is over 330 degrees, but uh, the Korion will be going into the moon's sphere of influence in just a couple of minutes. So I'm going to need to hop out there and deal with some business first. That business being setting up this capture and rendezvous burn. I'm going to try and do the capture and the rendezvous burn at the same time. And it's going to start with burning a little bit radially outwards to push my periapsis so it is just touching Shell Cal's orbit. There, that ought to do it. Now this is where I want my encounter to be. So I'm going to set up my node right here. And the idea here is to set up my capture burn, but to make the period of the resulting orbit such that after it does a single orbit, it will meet right up with uh, Shell Cal right back here again. And there won't be a need for further burn. So I'm looking at the close encounter indicators and I'm noticing but despite fiddling around with the amount of this burn, those indicators don't seem to be moving about. Doesn't seem to want to show the indicator. Yeah, it won't show the indicator in orbit ahead of where I am now, which is the one I need. Um, so what I did is I set up a second node just really close, but after this first node. Okay, so we'll drag this in nice and close. Okay, now let's see, let's see if I can hop ahead in orbit with this. So I have to put this on 10 times UT and that gives me those orbit ahead. Oh, they're grayed out. Oh wait, yeah, so they're not gonna work. Oh wait, I don't think, no, this isn't what I want anyway. What I wanna do is just give myself a little bit of retrograde right here. Now this is it. Yeah, oh, and now you can see that those close encounter indicators are starting to dance about. So keep going retrograde, retro, oh, oh, look at that. That's pretty close right there. And I see that's about an apoapsis of 167 kilometers. So what I'm going to do is delete that one and then set this one so that my apoapsis is in around 167 kilometers. Okay. A little bit more. Oh, oh, there we go. That's good enough. That's it. So that burns about an hour and a half away which gives me plenty of time to pop back out to Bill and get this other rescue on the road. Now, funny thing, uh, Bill, of course, is an engineer, and although there are two almost spanky, shiny news Curious orbiters attached to this particular station, um, neither of them have a probe core on it. So uh, although Bill can fly it, he, it will not be SAS compatible. That's an oversight on my part that is being fixed with the next curious that will come up here. But in the meantime, uh, Bill is stuck with the good old Kerr stock. <laughs> the predecessor to the curious that have been docked here forever, but has a probe core, so Bill's going to be able to use it effectively. So I suspect he may be blowing some dust off of those control panels. Uh, but anyway, this is a low urban, or low urban, low urban, low urban transfer. Uh, pretty routine, seen this done lots of times before. All right, that ought to do it. So we'll turn this normal. And you know what, we'll even do the polite thing of rolling the vessel so that the hatch is pointing towards Chris Nick. And let's take a look at, oh my God! Chris Nick is an engineer. Chris Nick is an engineer. You don't know how excited this makes me. Uh, other than giving Bill another partner in flagellants, um, I really needed, I've been short on engineers. I, 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 you probably have heard me bemoaning on a couple of episodes having no engineers about. And I was at the point where I was thinking, you know, I was going to have to upgrade the academy soon just so I could hire more Kerbals. I'm actually over my max as far as Kerbals go. But this removes that entirely. 
This is excellent. And then I got Shell Cal about to be picked up by the K2. And uh, yeah, this is pretty good. I'm, 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 I don't think I'll have to be hiring any Kerbals at all. So of course, we gotta now get ourselves back to Kerbin Station. All right, let's check on the Karayan. 55 minutes till the Karayan has to perform its burn. We can do this. Now, I'm gonna do this a little more smartly than I think I've done in the past. In the past, I've always been so concerned about saving fuel that I've always been sacrificing time for fuel economy, um, which is something that's pretty common uh, in space travel, but there's so little fuel burned by this little Kerr stock, I don't need to worry about that. So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna set up a rendezvous, kind of similar to what you just saw me do with the K2. So I'm gonna time warp over here to midnight, <laughs> mid dark side of the planet, and then I'm going to burn prograde, pushing up my periaps, ah, periapsis, apoapsis, of course, to the point where it is just touching uh, the orbit of Kerbin Station. And this is where I'm going to aim to have my rendezvous nicely illuminated on the day side of the planet, perfect for videos like this one. And uh, I'm going to do the same sort of thing I just did with the K2. I'm going to set up a prograde burn there to increase my period to a point so that the Kerstock will do one orbit and then come back and rendezvous with the station. There we go. That's looking pretty good. Phil, of course, had no trouble performing the burn uh, and that set him on an intercept trajectory. He will be rendezvousing with the station in about 36 minutes. Unfortunately, the K2 is coming to its burn, its capture burn, in about 26 minutes, so we best get ourselves back out to the moon. And as much as I am still enjoying watching these engines perform their burns, uh, I think it's best to keep this thing moving. So uh, what I'll do is I'll just cut towards the end of the burn. I did have to do a little bit of further tweaking, but I got my closest approach down to 0.6 kilometers, a little bit more than an hour away from now, which of course gives us plenty of time to get back to Bill and complete the rendezvous with the station. Bill, of course, performed admirably. You might be wondering why didn't I just to send these two back down to the surface. Um, I don't want to descend any of these folks until uh, they are ready to level up and Bill is not ready to level up. Actually I got, once this is all done, I got actually three Kerbals that are ready to level up. Um, Chris Nick of course will be ready to level up and uh, still working on their name, Shell Cal <laughs> will be ready to level up. Uh, they'll be both going to level one once, the, and I do want to finish off those contracts. And uh, actually Rodbart. Uh, from his orbit of the moon will put him to level two. So I want to wait until the K2 is back here and then we'll shuffle those three back down to the surface and we've got to shuffle some more people up to get ready for our next mission. But that obviously will be in a future episode. So right now we need to get back to uh, the K2, which we join after it has completed its orbit. And it's just about match velocities with Shell Cal's pod. Now, if you take a look over there on the right, you will see I have two contracts going. The one being to rescue Shell Cow, but the other one is to do a spacewalk near the moon. Well, that's easy enough. Boom. Done. And then, of course, all we have to do is get Shell Cow over to the K2 and dispose of this pod in our, in our usual ways. Wait, there was no sound. That explosion looked pretty cool, but... Okay, now, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make any sense that we're hearing that sound at all, but I think it makes even less sense if they're programming in a sound delay, like for the, <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm hoping that was just a glitch, that doesn't make any sense. And as these folks burn for home, I think I'm going to be drawing this particular episode to a conclusion. We'll be revisiting them for sure in the next episode as they close in on Curb and Station. And of course, we'll have lots of other stuff going, but that will have to be for later. I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.